it's New Year's. Mm -hmm. I, again, like I said, I, I can't believe it's New Year's. And what do we typically do every single New Year's? Come on, play with Make resolutions. Make resolutions. Right? Well, I thought instead of me telling you about some resolutions as I've done every year, I would just like to show you some resolutions. Go ahead and start that for me. Una, dos, is a lot of those resolutions are ours, <laughs> the ones we make, but I thought, you know, I saw that on, on, the, on the, the internet when I was looking for something else, and I said, you know, I think that's going to be kind of cool to kind of set the stage for what our message is about this New Year's. We watched this, uh, you know, cute video from the cats, and I would almost bet that all those cats abandoned their resolutions just like we abandoned ours, that they kind of put them to the side. For whatever reason, it just seems that we can't keep the commitments we make many times. Some of them we do, right? I know there's been a few that we make and we keep, but for the most part, we start them and, eh, you know, things happen, life happens, tragedies, uh, whatever the cause may be, we just sometimes forget about those resolutions and commitments that we make. But this morning, I really would like to talk about some resolutions, or better yet, some commitments that I can guarantee will make an awesome difference in our lives if we were just to follow through with them. In fact, I want to talk to you about four commitments we can make in the new year that will strengthen our walk with the Lord. Alex, you can go to that slide for me. The first one is commit yourselves to forget your failures. Commit yourselves to forget your failures. The second is commit yourself to give up your grudges. We all sometimes have grudges. Commit yourself to let them go. The third one, commit yourself to restore your relationships. Restore your relationships. And the fourth, commit yourself to turn your back on your transgressions or your sins. So I want to pray for a message this morning, and then we'll talk about the first commitment, which is forgetting your failures. Father, just give us insight. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to minister to us today. Father, I pray that this would be a timely message for all of us and that it would truly help us in this new year to live our lives in a healthy, strong relationship with you. 
So we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to learn from your word. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Commit yourself to forget your failures. So what does the Word of God have to say about this very topic, committing yourself to forget your failures? Well, let's read Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. It'll be up on the um, screen there, or, t or TV now. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. Too often we seem to hold on to our past failures and sometimes, what do we do? We even beat ourselves up over them. You know, we just kind of do some damage to our own lives by just constantly beating ourselves up for some of these past um, failures in our life. And do you think it's healthy to do that? It, it's not so much physically, but more so spiritually. It, it isn't healthy for us to do that in our lives. We don't have to live our lives, guys, imprisoned by our past. And many of us do, but we don't have to. We've all goofed up. I don't think there's one person in this room who can't say that they haven't goofed up in their life. That there's something they haven't done, something they haven't failed at, whether it's affected yourself or your family or your children or relationships or whatever. Every single one of us is goofed up. In fact, someone may have even done it just yesterday, maybe even last month. It doesn't matter when we've done it, when we've messed up. It matters that we know that we did, that we understand we did. And there's a difference between knowing in a healthy way of our failures and beating ourselves up over our past failures. What do you guys think the difference is between a healthy way of understanding your failures and beating yourself up? What, what's, what's the difference? Pardon? You forgive yourself. Okay, you can forgive yourself. Even what knowing else? that it's a failure, you can forgive yourself and not okay. give yourself up. Okay. Okay. What can be a health what can be healthy about remembering your past failures? Is, can there be something healthy about remembering them? You learn from them. Okay. Very good. So we learn it's a building block. Don't do it again. Won't do it again. Okay, what can be unhealthy about remembering our failures? Repeating them. What else? Dwell, you said, Lori? Pardon? You keep dwelling on it. Okay. Dwelling upon it. Yep. And you keep taking it back. Okay. That's that's a tough one. I'll give you a little visual that you might try that some my pastor shared with me is you get a box and you write on it God's box and it's sealed. You can't open it, but you have a slit in it, in the top. And you can write down what those things are, and you put them in that box, and you can't take them back. You're giving them to God. It's kind of a visual uh, that sometimes can help us in that area. But I think we're seeing that there's two ways, right? There's a healthy way, and there's an unhealthy way of remembering our past failures. Why now do you think that we hold on to the past failures of our lives? Okay, we talked about remembering them, but why do we hold on to them? Mary or April, could one of you get me some water in the bathroom there, please? Thank you. So why, why do you think we hold on to the failures of our past? See, I had a failure. I forgot to get water. <laughs> you feel guilty? Okay. What else? Why do we hold on to them? I'll tell you why I think we hold on to them. We have a supercomputer up here. 
Every single one of you have one. God gave it to you. And everything that you've ever done or seen or heard, guess where it is? It's stored in that memory bank. Can't always recall them all. But the ones that are meaningful or the ones that are tragic or the ones that are very difficult are seem to be the ones that always come back. That super brain just keeps playing it back, playing it back, playing it back. That's one of the reasons why we continually have these failures of our past. Sometimes these memories are painful. Uh, maybe it's a failed relationship. Maybe it was someone close to you. Could be a spouse, could be a friend, could be a mother, could be a father. doesn't matter who it is, but the relationship has failed. Maybe you made a wrong decision. Maybe it affected you or someone else in a negative way. Maybe as parents we failed our children in some way as we raised them. Maybe it's a past sin that continually haunts us and we can't stop remembering how we failed God. Maybe some of the younger teens, if there were any in here, we don't have any, so I'm going to go over the younger teens, but they might remember things that they've done in school, uh, taunting, bullying, right? These things can, can sit with the child for a very long time. I believe that most of us can agree that really we've all failed God at some point in our lives. And what the Apostle Paul is saying here in Philippians chapter 3, he's saying that we must not allow ourselves to be bogged down by these failures, by these past failures. In other words, we can't dwell on the past because it's going to stop us from moving forward into the future that God has for us. And what future does God have for you and me? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because we're going to answer it with a passage of Scripture that I believe many of you I know have committed to memory. And that's Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Does that just apply to some people? To some Christians? Listen, that applies to every one of us in this room. God knows the plans he has for you. Now he's saying, I know. He doesn't say you know. <laughs> That's hard, isn't it? But he says, I know the plans I have for you. But then he clues you in a little bit and he says, well, I'll tell you this much, they're not plans, or they're plans for good, not for disaster, not for evil, as some of your versions might say. He says, and my plans are to give you a future and a hope. So within his plans, he doesn't have anything in there for you to dwell upon the past and to stay in the past and beat yourself up. Jesus Christ died on the cruel cross of Calvary so that each and every one of us seated here today could be forgiven. And there was no other way that this could be accomplished. The only way we could be forgiven is by his death, by the shedding of his blood. The Bible says without the remission or without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. His blood had to be shed. So when we gave our lives to Christ, forgiveness became a reality within our own lives. And forgiveness of what we've done, our, to forgive ourselves, to let go of this stuff. God doesn't remember it, so why should we? You see, when we receive the forgiveness of Jesus, it allows us to forgive, forgive ourselves and to forget our failures, to let them go, to not remember them. Maybe someone here this morning needs to be reminded of this fact. I don't know what all of you are going through. I know that I needed to be reminded. I needed to be reminded that I'm forgiven of my past failures, and I have many of them. And many times, I, they run through my mind. Why? Why did I? Uh, whoa. And it just drives me crazy. 
And God's just telling me this wonderful reminder, Peter, I don't know what you're talking about. I got a future, not forget the past. I got a future. That's my plan for you. Your future. Forget your failures. You learn from them. Go forward. The cool thing about the Lord is that you can do the very thing that he desires you to do with his strength to let go of those failures. And you can do it right in the quiet of your heart. You can do it right now, even while you're sitting here. You can just say, Lord, I give it to you. I don't want to think about it anymore. Give me the strength to let it go. So our first commitment to the Lord is to commit to forgetting our failures. And I think that sounds like a pretty good resolution for the new year, don't you? Forget your failures. Let them go. Now let's talk about the second resolution or commitment. Commit yourself to give up your grudges. What does the Word of God say about grudges? Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Make allowance for each other's fault and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you so you can forgive others if you feel like it. Oh, did I read that wrong? So you can forgive others. Period. There is nothing after that. Did you catch the challenge there? We're challenged by Jesus himself directly and personally to give up our grudges. That's what it means in verse 13 when it says, And forgive anyone who offends you. What does anyone mean? Anyone? Is anyone excluded from anyone? So anyone always means everyone, anyone that you need to do this to. Let's talk about what a grudge is. What's a grudge? Tell me, what's a grudge? Give me some examples. We all got them. Should be easy. An ill feeling towards someone. Okay, and the ill feeling towards someone? Something that you hold against somebody that they've done to you. Okay. Why is everybody looking at me when they say that? <laughs> what else? Resentment. Resentment. Could jealous, jealousy be part of a grudge? You're jealous about what someone may have gotten or done or received? They got that promotion instead of you, so you're holding a grudge? There's many, many reasons why we have grudges. A grudge is a deep, ongoing resentment that we cultivate in our hearts against somebody else. I'm going to say that again. It is a deep, ongoing resentment that we cultivate in our hearts against someone else. It's an unfortunate spirit that leads to really unforgiving attitudes and actions. Because sometimes our actions are fueled by grudges. I want to drill down just a little bit further with what a grudge can be. I believe that harboring a grudge is nursing a dislike for someone. Mary, you're a nurse. What does that word nursing mean? Nursing a grudge. Nursing or harboring a dislike for someone. Um, I don't know about that. It's, it's, uh, you're going to dwell on it constantly, constantly, constantly. Okay. So when you're nursing someone in the hospital, what do you got to do? You have to be on it, don't you? You got to be there. You got to nurse them. You got, oh, I got to take care of this. You, you know? But now you can nurse in a negative way by nursing that grudge and just fueling it. Keep adding fuel to that, that flame, to that grudge. Grudges can be dangerous and they can hurt. Grudges can destroy marriages. Grudges can break up families. 
Grudges can put a wedge between children and family, husband and wife. Grudges can ruin friendships, relationships. They can even split churches. And that's just to name a few. There's many, many other things that grudges can do. I want to read you a real-life example of what grudges can do from this short news clip I found on the Internet. <clears throat> a man was killed by a parcel bomb which was sent from a couple earlier in the week. The couple who had sent the bomb committed suicide one week after the incident. It turned out that the couple who had committed suicide had sent the bomb because of a grudge that the husband had against his intended victim, which went all the way back to high school. Now think about that. It didn't say what the grudge was over. But a grudge that went all the way back to high school, we were talking about nursing a grudge. Well, obviously, this man had been nursing this grudge for all these years, and it got to the point where he talked about it with his wife, and they were both equally fueled, and what did they do? They killed this man. And then after, I think, realizing what they did, they committed suicide and took their own lives. Grudges are dangerous. They can cause massive problems. Ultimately, that man's grudge destroyed his victim's life, and it destroyed his and his wife's life as well. We need to understand that if we keep harboring a grudge, then it can eventually cause tremendous problems within our life, and it can even destroy us as it has done to that couple we just talked about. Being destroyed by a grudge can come in many different forms. It could be in the form of physical, emotional, or even spiritual destruction. Grudges can make us bitter and resentful. If you want to see some biblical examples of this, of grudges making us bitter and resentful, we won't cover it this morning, I don't have time. But in your spare time, read Job chapter 21. And that describes people who have no happiness whatsoever and they live and die with bitter hearts because of grudges. I want to read you a quote I found from Max Lucado about this topic. Unforgiving servants always end up in prison. Prison of anger, guilt, and depression. I mean, it's just short, sweet, and to the point. Unforgiving servants, that's us, servants of the Most High. We end up in a prison, a prison of anger, guilt, and depression. And I think I know I found myself in that place, not for long, not for long periods of time, but I know I found myself in that place at times because of grudges. And so that's why as I was putting this together, it probably, as I've told you before, the messages usually minister more to me than they probably do to you. God really busts me sometimes of the things that I do. According to what we read in Colossians 3.13, the way to give up our grudges is to simply forgive. That's the solution. Forgive. And this doesn't mean that you need to ignore whatever this person may have done to you. We're not asked to pretend that it didn't happen. We're not even asked to condone it, but to simply forgive the grievance. We're human. You can not have to pretend it didn't take place. You, you don't have to like the person. You don't have to hang out with a person. But you got to forgive the person. And that comes from here, the heart. And who gives you the strength to do that? Does it, does it come from your intellect? So who gives you the strength to do that forgiveness? It comes again from here, from the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. He's the one that's going to give you the strength to do that very thing. Apart from him, forget it. You can't do it. If you try to do it in your flesh, you're going to fail miserably. If you sit down and say, I'm, going to for I'm just going to forgive this person. I'm just going to do it. And you, you try to do it from your intellect, it's not going to work. You have to be in an attitude of prayer. And let the Lord give you the strength that you need to forgive that grievance that you're holding. 
There's something very important also that I want to talk about that we haven't covered from this passage, and it's not long. And it's the first six words of that verse, which says, Make allowance for each other's faults. Make allowance for each other's faults. What does that mean? What do you think that means with that word allowance for each other's faults? Anyone? Give them some slack. Give them some slack? Okay. Understand that nobody's perfect. Under, there you go. Understand nobody's perfect. I've said that to people many times when I, in my anger, when they say something to me that just is so ridiculous that they say, and I just say, I'm just, oh, I'm so sorry. I wish I could be perfect like you, you know, and I know I shouldn't say that, but I have <laughs> in the past. But yeah, make an allowance. An allowance means that there, there's going to be some of that happening, isn't there? It, it's going to be there, so you, you have to make some allowance for it. And if you do, it's going to be that much easier to forgive because you're going to kind of know, hey, all right, I understand, you know, people can do that. In fact, I could probably do it. In fact, I probably have done it. You know, the things you hold grudges over people, guess what? Usually you've done the very same thing yourself, haven't you? That's why you're holding the grudge. Because you're mad at yourself because you've done it. And if you think back, you'll see that that's a very true statement. We've covered forgetting our failures, giving up our grudges as these commitments and resolutions for 2017. Let's talk about the third. Commit yourself to restore your relationships. Oh, Peter, not this one, please. Please, I don't, I don't want to talk about this one. For those of us who use computers in our lives, that excludes some of you out there, I know. But for those of us who use them, there are times that we need to check to make sure that our computers are running smoothly. We need to update our virus definitions, clean out the clutter of old files and temporary files that take up space and memory. Sometimes your computer even asks you that if you would like it to check and see if things are working correctly. Some of the newer computers have that built into their software. Well, I believe that God in his word has a very, very similar invitation for us. But the invitation is not for your computer, but to check whether your personal relationships are working as intended, as they should work. Let's read about this in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. There we read, Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. What does all mean? All. Does all exclude anything? No. So do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Now how's that for getting right to the heart of the matter? You see, the important phrase, to live in peace with everyone, is preceded with another important phrase, do all that you can. In other words, do all that you can to restore your relationships. And some of your relationships in your life have gone wrong because of what other people may have done, and they might not want that relationship restored. But I need to tell you, God knows that. He understands that. That's why verse 18 starts out by saying, do all that you can. If somebody has done something to you and they don't want that relationship restored, God knows that. But in a sense, he still says, I still want you to try and do all that you can. That might mean he's going to prompt you to reach out. A person might say no. But eventually, if God keeps prompting you to reach out, eventually that person might say, I'm ready for this relationship to be healed. And what a wonderful thing that is when that takes place, isn't it? When relationships become healed. But let's be honest, even those relationships where others have done wrong to us, they still have a hint, right? A hint of having some of us doing wrong to them. In fact, it's probably more than a hint. 
remember, it takes two to tango. And I know with most, well, everyone in this room, I know that every one of you know what that means, it takes two to tango. I said that to my son the other day, and he looked at me like I was from the moon. Huh? What do you mean, Dad? Tango? <laughs> Sometimes you take these things for granted that the, everyone will understand these phrases that we use. But it does. It takes two to tango. It takes two people to have an argument. It takes two people to cause a situation for a relationship to split. It's never a one-way street. And so that's something that we also have to pray about and remember in these times that we ask the Lord to help us to heal relationships. I think reading Romans chapter 12, verse 18 out of another version also adds some insight to what the Lord is asking us to do when it comes to relationships. We're going to read it now out of the ESV. Here it says, if possible, if possible, so far as it depends on you, Live peaceably with all. Now, when it says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, it just simply means that some of those relationships will depend on you and some on the other party. Enough said on that. You know that it's something that we all have issues with and something that I think every one of us has to work on. But that which depends upon you is more than what we want to admit because of our flesh. We don't want to admit the things that depend upon us to heal a relationship. We always, always want to kind of push the blame to the other as much as we can. You know what the most difficult thing to do is when it comes to restoring relationships? It's forgiveness. That's the most difficult thing to do in restoring a relationship is forgiveness. And the type, of forgive, the type of forgiveness that we're talking about is asking them to forgive you. Asking for forgiveness, not you forgiving them, but you asking for their forgiveness if you've wronged them. Why is asking for forgiveness so difficult? Why? Speak up because I can't hear oh. the fan. Because <clears throat> you, um, you might feel that you, um, you're admitting that you're wrong. Okay. You're admitting you're wrong and you don't want to do that. Maybe That's, you weren't wrong. Maybe you weren't wrong. Yeah. That's true sometimes too. Sometimes the, the, the majority of it's on the other person. Why else is forgiveness so difficult? And we're talking about asking for forgiveness. Why is that so difficult, asking someone for forgiveness? Pride. Pride. Boom. There it is. Pride. That is the biggest thing that stops us from doing anything we're learning about here this morning for our New Year's message is pride. That's what makes it so difficult to stop. I don't think that I'm the only person in this room who finds it hard to say I'm sorry. To say I'm sorry to the people I've hurt or to the people I've wronged. And I've had to do it. Many of you know that. <laughs> I've had to do it. I've had to stand before people and say I'm sorry. And it wasn't easy. But I knew it's what God wanted me to do. And he's the one that gave me the strength to do it. Just as he will give you the strength to say I'm sorry for what I've done to you. Even if you feel that the majority of the blame is on the other. It's still okay to say, I'm sorry. There's a scripture that says when you show this type of kindness to people, right? It says it's like heaping what? Coals upon their head. Hot coals upon their head. They're being ministered to. And they're being convicted by your kindness. By you reaching out. There's people in my life that I do still need to approach to try and restore relationships with. And I know it's not easy, but I know that the Lord will give me the opportunity if I ask. And that's the key. It's too easy to push away and not ask. The difficult thing is to ask and say, Lord, 
if I need to reach out to a relationship to ask for forgiveness, show me. Show me who it is. Give me an opportunity. Bring up a situation. You have not because you ask not. That doesn't just work for getting a brand new Cadillac, right? Have not because you ask not means for spiritual things. You have not because you're not asking. You're not seeking. And when we do, God answers. And he answers in miraculous ways. Pastor Keith Drury, uh, I found on the internet, says this about restoring relationships. Restitution deals with more than property. It is also going back and making things right for hurtful things I've said or done. It's far easier for me to tell you some story than to tell you of the difficult and painful times I've had to ask my wife, my boys, my boss, friends, and secretary to forgive me. Restitution is asking forgiveness for harsh words, a quick tongue, or cutting remarks. It is asking forgiveness from a brother you hurt, a mother you caused heartache to, or a former spouse which you hurt. Restitution is confessing and seeking forgiveness from an old business partner, neighbor, or roommate. It is admitting my past errors and relationships and humbly seeking forgiveness from the ones I've hurt. And it's harder to make personal restitution than property restitution. It's a lot easier to say, let me open up my checkbook and write you a check for the damage. It's much easier to do that than it is to do personal restitution. Maybe some of us are feeling a little on edge on this one, because I said this is the tough one. Maybe we're feeling a little on edge and saying, come on, Pete, let's move on. You're something stern inside you. You don't like it. You don't want to deal with it. Well, I've got good news for you, and I've got bad news. Which one do you want first? Well, I'll give you the good first, because you said that. <laughs> the good news is that our feeling on the edge, this gnawing inside us, if that's what's happening to you, that's not coming from you. That's coming from the Holy Spirit. That's good news. Because he's alive and well inside you. And he's ministering, and he's prodding, and he's poking. That's good news. The bad news is that we need to get out of our comfort zone and we need to do as the Lord asks us and ask Him for the opportunity. So, we've talked about forgetting our failures, giving up our grudges, restoring relationships, and many are going, it's past this one, let's go to the last one. Commit yourselves to turn your back on your transgressions. Did you know that history shows us a very interesting fact about the, <clears throat> the Civil War. At the end of the war, the slaves, they'd been set free because they were in bondage before the war ended. So they were set free from that bondage, but many slaves decided to stay with their former masters and to continue living as slaves. I tell you this story is an illustration because the New Testament says that we as Christians must also choose how to live. Jesus died to set us free, and the Holy Spirit has given us the power to be free. But just like those former slaves, many Christians still choose to obey their old master. Who's their old master? Sin. Right? So many times Christians continue to want to obey their old master, sin. I want you to listen to what Paul says about this in Romans chapter 6, verse 12. He says, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. That's pretty cut and dry. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. It's a great way to bring in the new year by committing in our hearts to not let sin control the way we live and to not give in to its lustful desires. And we have the benefit of having the Holy Spirit who's ready, willing, and able to help us accomplish this very goal within our lives. So we know the Lord wants us to turn our backs on our transgressions. And this brings up one question that is very important, I believe, for every Christian to understand. And the question is, 
What is the difference between sin, transgression, and iniquity? In Psalm 32, 5, let's read that to give us some insight. It says this, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And say, is just a pause. Meditate on that is what it means. Well, what is he saying? So, we see sin, iniquity, and transgression all in this one verse. Now these words, they all communicate the same idea. They communicate evil and lawlessness. Yet at the same time, each of these words carries a different meaning. Sin simply means to miss the mark. Okay, you missed the mark. Sin also has some additional meanings, such as doing something against God or against a person. In addition, it means doing the opposite of what is right, or doing something that will have negative results. It can also mean failing to do something you know is right. Now, a transgression refers to presumptuous sin. It means to choose to intentionally disobey. To intentionally disobey. Samson did this by intentionally breaking his Nazarite vow and by cutting his hair. That was a transgression. Lori, did you I, need? I need a couple of men, please. Okay. I need a couple of strong men. Butch took a fall. He's okay. He's okay? All right. Well, I guess the Lord wants me to talk to you ladies. Huh. wonder what that's all about. <laughs> so we know what a transgression is, right? We talked about that. Failing to do something that we know is, or, or failing to do the, what we know is right or a premeditated choice. Now, iniquity, that's thinking about it, planning it meditating on what you're going to do without any repentance. That's iniquity. David committed an iniquity when he purposed in his heart to kill Bathsheba, or not Bathsheba, but her husband, Uriah. Now, you remember the story, what he did. He was an adulterer with her, and he didn't want to get caught. So what did he do? He planned. He planned what he was going to do. He purposed in his heart that he was going to kill this man. That's an iniquity. The Lord wants us to stop obeying our old master. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross, he broke the power of sin, and the Holy Spirit gives us the power to resist sin. And for the New Year's, what that means is that we don't have to be defeated by sin, transgressions, or iniquity. We don't have to be. New Year's isn't anything special. It has no magical powers. It's not going to make all these things happen and come true. We all know that. The only thing that the New Year's does for us, it just reminds us of what? A fresh start. We have a fresh start. That's really what it's telling us about. A fresh start that each and every one of us here this morning has so that we can commit ourselves to forget our failures, to give up our grudges, to restore our relationships, and to turn our back on our transgressions. And that means to repent. What does repent mean? Who can tell me? Do a 180. What's a 180? There's sin. I'm walking towards it. And repentance means I do a 180. I turn around and I put my back to the sin and I walk the other direction. I walk to the cross. Not the dove, but to the cross. It's in the dove. That's what repentance is.